Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, we do a deep dive into Canada's relationship with its Indigenous peoples and its Indigenous communities. What are the problems and more importantly, what are the solutions? The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. It's the Friday show, which means we do things a little bit differently rather than delving into the news of the day, which this past week has been rather depressing. We take a big issue and do a deep dive into it, not necessarily trying to solve all the problems of the world, but certainly trying to give it the attention and insight it very much needs. And the issue I want to talk about today is the relationship that Canada has with its Indigenous citizens and its Indigenous communities. Every election this comes up, between elections this comes up, we have stories about energy projects being met with Indigenous or purportedly Indigenous protesters. We have the announcements of unmarked graves at the sites of former residential schools. We had Justin Trudeau lowering the Canadian flag. We have all of these things, but are we anywhere close to finding a solution to these challenges? Is such a solution even possible? We have two fantastic guests here to discuss this. Melissa Embarkey is an Indigenous woman herself, a policy analyst and outreach coordinator at the McDonald laurie Institute, and also a woman with over 14 years of experience in Canada's oil and gas sector. Also, we have Dr. Heather exner Perot, a fellow with the McDonald laurie Institute and a researcher who's done a number of work in political science, but also specifically looking at Indigenous issues, Northern issues, and Indigenous economic development. Heather, Melissa, thank you both so much. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having us. I want to start with you on this one, Melissa. When we talk about these issues between Indigenous communities and Canada or the Canadian government specifically, is it clear what we're even talking about here? I know that there tends to be this view of Indigenous people as one homogenous group, which we know is not the case. There are issues in the North, issues in the West, issues in my part of the country, in, in Southern Ontario, clean drinking water, energy projects, resistance to energy projects. So what are we really talking about here as being the problem or, or problems? That's true. I mean, the concerns that you would have in Saskatchewan where I grew up, aren't gonna be the same concerns that you have in British Columbia, for example. Um, so we have to really parse out what the issue is. We need to know the area that's in question. We need to kind of know, you know, what's what's in conflict. You know, what are these communities not agreeing on? And I think we really have to start at the grassroots level. Like, is this an issue within the community that doesn't necessarily deal with, you know, operators or natural resource development? And a lot of the times what you're going to see is that it's actually issues within the communities themselves. And, you know, and it kind of pours out into the public as an opposition to something, which isn't true. So let me just drill down into that uh, a little bit further, if I can here, because when we are talking about experiences or, or frustrations that Indigenous Canadians hold that that require political solutions in some way. We'll, we'll narrow it down a little bit there. How many of these issues are, are really just general concerns that impact all Canadians in the same way that, you know, affordability, taxes and regulations do versus concerns that are very specific to Indigenous people? Well, what we can see and what I've been seeing in the last little while is, you know, when you have an, uh, take for example, under Bill C-15, this directly impacted Indigenous communities and it impacted, you know, people like myself. Whereas if I'm looking, you know, broader and more general, you, when you look at urban areas, that's not going to be an issue, you know, so we have to look at the bills and who they impact and how they impact them, because it could impact us differently than it would a Canadian. Um, a, you know, a taxpayer in an urban area. So in, in, even with water, we have to look at, you know, different facets of it. You know, we have to look at it from a municipality level, from a reserve perspective, and even right down to, you know, can we access water from other sources? So we're intertwined in a lot of ways, but bills and legislation that goes through is often very specific for reserves. And we need to kind of look at that um, from, a, like from an internal reserve, you know, perspective, 
Whereas, you know, from your perspective, it might not be an issue, but for us, it would be pretty big. How did you, Heather, get so tied in with Indigenous issues in the first place? Uh, good question. I'm not an Indigenous person. I'm from Saskatchewan. And I think growing up in Saskatchewan in the 90s, we didn't talk about treaties. Uh, we didn't talk about residential schools. There was none of that. I even went through university in a social sciences degree and had almost no Indigenous content at the University of Saskatchewan in the 90s. Um, so it was actually when I did my master's, I did it. I liked, you know, international development was a big thing. And I did it uh, in southern Chile uh, with uh, the Uiche and the Mapuche people. And then when I came back to Canada, it was like, oh, we have a lot of these same Indigenous issues here too. Um, so just started working on that, started working on some Arctic things, which is, you know, a lot of Indigenous things there. Um, and then did start doing more Northern and Indigenous development. And that's how I got involved with the Saskatchewan Indigenous Economic Development Network. And I guess my, my PhD is in political science, but, you know, and Melissa knows this too, when you start to think about all the problems water, poverty, education, housing, things like that, uh, health, mental health, addictions, trauma, the solution is often found in economic development, having jobs, having, having resources, having opportunities um, so that the community can solve these issues themselves and not have to rely on the federal government. So I think you touched on a, a very important part of the discussion here when you bring up economic development, because I, I've read a lot of frustrations in particular from, from Indigenous folks in Canada about what seem like very symbolic responses. And, and that could be the flag being lowered, the Canadian flag being lowered for several months, statues coming down, uh, commemorations around residential schools. And it's not to say that there's anything uh, bad or, or disqualifying about doing any of these issues, but if you're not accompanying it with anything that's solving these underlying issues, you're, you're not really doing all that much. So why is economic development, in your view, the road to solving a lot of those concerns that you just laid out there that are very distinct? From my perspective, self-determination is maybe the most important human and community right. Nations deserve to have self-determination. I think most people can agree with that. That's the fundamental Western, liberal, Indigenous kind of a value. And in the last 30, 40 years, uh, First Nations peoples, Métis peoples, Inuit people have made great strides in political self-determination, getting kind of de jure uh, legal, uh, more control, more power over their affairs. But that has not been paired with economic self-determination. So when you still rely on the federal government for 80 or 90 percent of your revenues, it's very hard to be self-determining. It's very hard to make your own decisions. And you still have to go and get permission from the minister and the Indian Act uh, to do any of those things or get funding if you want to do more in housing or education or health. So for me, having that, um, the independence that comes from having your own sources of revenues and not relying on another level of government, which is often antagonistic, uh, is, is the best way for First Nations to, to have self-determination and therefore make their own decisions, which we know in governance and political science theory are going to be better decisions than other people making those for them. Uh, we know, Melissa, there are some very wealthy uh, communities, especially out West, that can rely very heavily on natural resource development. There are also communities that don't have that to lean on. Uh, some communities in the far North that don't have uh, necessarily oil resources in Southern Ontario, Quebec that, that don't as well. So is that idea of being able to develop economically something that can be more evenly attained, or is it very limited to just that kind of one part of the country, the West? Well, I definitely think, um, you know, sovereignty is the key in this because each community knows how they can move forward and better their, um, better their community. Mine, for example, like we don't have access to natural resources, uh, but where we've invested is in bringing our child and family services back to my community. So we've worked with the provincial and federal government to do this. And in addition to this, you know, we're opening a treatment center, we're opening a family healing center. So we're doing things, you know, that will bring jobs to our community, not a whole lot of jobs that a natural resource sector would bring, but they are jobs, long-term jobs, nonetheless. So when we, so we have to listen to First Nations communities and what they want. You know, we can't be telling them you need to do this, this, and this because each area is different. Some are more north, some are south, some are in areas, you know, but next to urban areas like Enoch First Nation is next to Edmonton. So they have a better chance of being economically independent whereas some reserves don't. So this is where each voice matters. And this is where listening to the communities matter because what they want and what they need, you know, they've thought this through, like mine did. So 
that's why it is important to listen to the elected chief and councils and what they are asking for. I'd like to talk in in a bit of detail with you both about what it is that Indigenous communities want. And I I realize that this could change from community to community. And I mean, growing up, and and this could be coming from a place of ignorance, the primary concern that I was exposed to uh, involved land claims. And, you know, I'm from Southern Ontario. We had a couple of very high profile cases about land claims and and about land development and and these sorts of community uh, community projects that were encroaching on, on territory that was in dispute. How central are the land claim issues still in in 2021 to a lot of the concerns? Oh, there's a lot of concerns with land claims because if anything, they take decades to resolve. Like this isn't a process that's going to happen tomorrow. So I think what the government needs to do is they need to eliminate some of that red tape in between, you know, and they need to start working with First Nations on where their land is and ha- and and resolve these claims, you know. Otherwise, we're going to continue seeing protests. We're going to continue seeing, um, you know, delays in everything. So I think what we need to do is definitely start working on those 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 TLE land claims in Saskatchewan. Get them finalized. You know, work on Ontario. Get those finalized. Let's get those out of the way first, so that First Nations can thrive and succeed. And you touch on something there that I imagine is just a massive, massive undertaking. And I I don't know politically in Canada, and I'll I'll go to you on this, Heather, is that even possible within, you know, one, two or or three terms of a government to resolve this? I think people need to know, like a a land claim in the North is not the same as land claim in Saskatchewan, is not the same as a land claim in BC, because the history and the governance and the agreements were all made at different times and on different things. Um, and so in BC where, you know, there was no treaty is a very different situation from Saskatchewan where it was just not enough was given, you know, in the in, in what was promised originally. And in the North, again, it's it's kind of a whole different um, cattle of fish. So, so, so these are, di- there's moving targets. The other thing is that this, there's two parties to this. And so maybe a federal government would like to settle something in BC, but the community is not ready to come to an agreement or ha- hasn't had the time to do their due diligence or doesn't have the capacity to do their due diligence in the settlement either. And sometimes maybe it's the federal government that's dragging their heels. So it's not, you know, there are different circumstances with different communities and how that happens. Why do we want these settled? I think if you're interested in economic development and resource development, knowing who gets to make the final decision, who's the decision maker, who can enter agreements under what conditions would be very helpful. Obviously, we're seeing that now with wet wind territory where, where there's you know confusion over who is able to enter these agreements. Uh, and you don't have quite the same problem in the north. There are some competing claims, but to a lesser extent or in the treaty areas, you know, where again, it is more settled. So just having that certainty um, of knowing who gets to make the decisions and how their impacts. I think what people don't appreciate, I'm sure Melissa would agree, most indigenous people are not against resource development. They're against being left out. So if you're gonna have development in their territory, not consult, um, not avoid sacred sites, not involve people in the economic benefits that comes from it, yes, that's going to be a problem. But if you have settled land claims, the community is involved, the nation's involved, they've agreed to a set of, of, of terms, they've agreed to the benefits, they have time prepared to, to uh, benefit, then they will probably be in favor. Almost, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of mining agreements, forestry agreements, oil and gas agreements. Uh, more often than not, they want that. So just having the certainty for the developer, for the nation, for all levels of government, of, over whose land it is, who has title, is so important. Well, I know that was a big issue. I, I think it was early last year with, with Tech Frontier withdrawing from uh, its uh, project or, or Tech r- r- withdrawing from the Frontier project. And one of the big concerns was a lot of the uncertainty surrounding uh, I- Indigenous communities and, and pushback they were they were nervous about from from protests. And when you hear stories like that, Melissa, what, what's your take on it? Because you've obviously been connected to Indigenous people that really want these projects, yet at the same time, for a lot of companies, they just see, uh, they, they see a lot of of indigenous protest as being barriers to development? I think, you know, we kind of seen something similar in my own community where we agreed on something, uh, you know, the chief and council got 80% buy-in from the people. And we had four, four or five people who weren't in agreeing, in agreements to it. So, you know, they were causing some chaos and they were, you know, trying to block highways and trying to block railroads because they didn't agree with this with what was uh, proposed. So what ended up happening is, you know, we 
try to incorporate them more into the discussions. You know, we tried to get, you know, specific answers of why they opposed it. You know, we got their side of the story of, you know, kind of where their thinking was going. And I think that's what most First Nations need to do. You need to include the people, even the ones that are opposing it. And we need to understand why. And we need to look at the specific reasons why. And I think if First Nations communities don't do this, they're going to see more opposition. Like it's just going to grow and grow and grow. So part of it is up to us, you know, to make sure that education and knowledge is given at the right times and, you know, and even including them in decisions along the way. Because if that's not happening, you're going to always have that divide. So I think as First Nations, that's kind of what we have to deal with now is we have to get communities on board and get everyone on board with the decision making. And I'll add to that, Andrew, because I think the frontier case is an interesting one because the affected communities in the territory, and there's a little bit of discretion about who decides who's in the territory, but they were all in support. They had, you know, their agreements in place uh, with tech. And the uncertainty came from whether the federal government would approve it anyways. Uh, so the uncertainty was 100% on the federal side. In that case, Tech good, did a good job actually consulting with First Nations and Métis uh, settlements around there. And, and so, and, and that's the problem you're seeing today. And I think people are blaming, and Melissa knows this, people will blame First Nations, but the problem is often not with the First Nations side. It's with, you know, the, the political side of governments who, who, you know, maybe urban, you know, their urban voters aren't in favor project, even though it doesn't impact them directly. And then having to try to navigate that. And it's certainly like, we've lost like over a hundred billion dollars, $150 billion in energy projects uh, in the last four years in Canada. We will lose mining projects. We are not a competitive space for resource development because it is not easy to get a permit. It is not easy to get regulatory approval. And you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Northern Gateway spent $700 million, some people say more, to get to the point of getting told no. And we're seeing Keystone XL do that too, suing the, the Biden administration $15 billion that they sunk into this after getting all the approvals. So there's a, a lot of blame being laid at the feet of First Nations. Uh, but I don't think that's usually where the problem is. Well, that actually touches on, I, I think, a very important point, which is that we see a lot of people in, in Canada who are, are ideologically against oil and gas sector development. They're against pipelines that tend to latch on to indigenous causes or, or purported indigenous causes. And, and I know when you see some of these uh, photos from some of these events, you're, you're looking and you're like, these are just environmental activists that I'm not sure are even from this community. How, how big an issue is that, Melissa? That's a really big issue. And a, and a good example is the Wet'suwet'en community. You know, like they, they took advantage of that divide and they took advantage of the people who opposed the pipelines and they sided with them and media, you know, the media ran with it and, you know, told the story that wasn't necessarily the true story of what was going on. And, you know, I think what we need to do is we need to hear all sides of the story. And this is why I think Chief and Council is really important in getting that messaging out because at the end of the day they're the ones that make the decisions and they're the ones that go through this consultation process like they're the ones that are on the ground trying to get these deals completed finished signed and yet they're the ones that are kind of you know they're kind of vilified in a sense um when they do say yes i'm in agreement to this because of outsiders who may not agree with the project so it's a very thin line, you know, that we're walking and we need to, and I'm, I come from the space where we need to tell all sides of the story. We can't just tell one. I, I want to talk for a moment, if we can, about that idea of the, the lack of homogeneity within the Indigenous communities in Canada, because there isn't just one leader or one spokesperson that can represent all an Indigenous people. And I, I know this is a challenge. If you did have a, a leader, a prime minister that really wanted to, to get down and, and deal with this and address the concerns, who are they negotiating with? Who are they engaging in dialogue with? And I was wondering if you could speak to that, Heather. I mean, how complex would that process be to, to really completely start from scratch on, on the Crown Indigenous relationship in Canada? Well, there's, I mean, there's a, there's so much going on there, as you know, Andrew. So a lot of the problem stems from the fact that, you know, the Indian Act kind of disrupted traditional governance systems and created this, you know, a democratically elected chief and council who weren't necessarily representative, you know, for the first hundred years, you know, was maybe more the, um, you know, acting kind of as an Indian agent, but now that has evolved. And so now almost every First Nation 
I think every First Nation uses elections, even if they have had their own land claim and could choose a different system, but people still prefer normally a democratically elected system and a chief and council. But it's different in different places. In some parts in the prairies, there isn't a hereditary system anymore, or, or you know, it's been absorbed into kind of a democratic system. We're in NBC, uh, in some communities and some nations, there are still the two kinds. So it's not as though there's hereditary chiefs or that there's the same governance system all across Canada. Uh, and it's just, you know, out of control in BC or something like that. Uh, and in lots of cases, like the Haida, you know, they built it into the constitution. It works well. They have figured out a way for elected and hereditary chiefs to work, you know, for the for the best well-being of the community. So it's not as though it's an inherently dysfunctional system to have a traditional and, and, and an elective council. Um, but just, you know, in this particular community, there's a, a big polarization. And going back to your earlier question, people are definitely using the Wet'suwet'en nation to further their own agenda, probably on both sides, but I think a little bit more on the other side to, to blatantly, you know, uh, disregard the fact that the elected councils are in favor, to disregard the fact the majority of people are in favor, have voted for this in referendums, have re-elected chiefs and counselors who are in favor of it, to just disregard all those people because they prefer the hereditary chief's message in this case. And yet, you know, on C48 and the Haida Nation, we're happy to strip hereditary chiefs of their titles because they supported oil and gas, or we're happy to strip our hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en of their titles because they supported LNG. So there is definitely some selective support for Indigenous rights, and it does, you know, it does look like to the observer that you support Indigenous rights when Indigenous rights support your agenda. And, and, it, and if the hereditary chiefs took a different stance on this, I don't think they would get the same kind of support. I think we all know that. I appreciate the background on the the elected versus the hereditary chiefs, because I know that's been a, a source of confusion, especially through some of these protests in, in the last year and a bit. I mean, my, my question was more about nationally. There, there's no one national leader of all Indigenous communities who could go to the federal government and, and negotiate on behalf of those. So I, I'm just interested in what a renegotiation of the Indian Act and a renegotiation of, of the government's relationships with Indigenous people would look like. How big would that be? And does that mean it would be too big to really be possible in, in our political system? I'll speak to that quickly, Melissa. The strategy that the federal government has chosen is to use opt-in legislation. So there are quite a few you know, let federal government legislations that remove parts of the Indian Act. So the First Nations Land Management Act, First Nations Oil and Gas Management Act, First Nations Election Act, which communities can opt into. So when they negotiate it, it doesn't mean the 674, you know, however you count it, First Nations all have to say yes or all have to say no, but they can take their turn and decide for themselves when they opt in. Um, so the Land Management Act, Melissa probably knows this very well, it takes away about a third of the Indian Act, all the sections, provisions of the Indian Act that, that provide for you know, the lands and that can turn over to the community and the community develops its own land code. So that's, and, and for me, that's the only logical strategy. You can't force 670 plus First Nations to agree on something. They are independent nations. And so this opt-in you know, strategy, I think is not perfect, but probably the least imperfect. Do you wanna add on to that, Melissa? Yeah, I think what needs to happen is you need to start giving some of these communities, the ones who are ready, you need to start giving them sovereignty. And you need to start giving them autonomy on certain, um, you know, when it comes to land, for example, from the Indian Act, they need to be able to manage their land the way they see fit. And we're not seeing, you know, the government let go of this control. If anything, you know, they try to implement more control on First Nations communities. So what we need to see is we need to give them the resources to manage their communities, you know, and this would, you know, help them come up with solutions to some of their issues like poverty or child and family. So the more autonomy that you give them, you know, the better that they're going to be managing their systems. It's going to bring jobs to those communities. It's going to bring, in, it, they're going to thrive at the end of the day. And that's what we want to see. But with the Indian Act, it's really constrained. And you can't, like Heather said, you can't apply it to all the First Nations reserves in Canada because each is different. So I think we have to get out of this mindset that we're a monolith, we all operate the same way because we don't. And you know, this is where sovereignty comes into play. If you give these communities a chance to make their own decisions, they're going to be decisions that are the best for them and for the rest of Canada.
So what would sovereignty, we'll start with the land aspect specifically, management of land, Melissa, what would sovereignty look like in practice? And more importantly, what, what has the government really used as its primary argument against granting that? So land can be tricky. Um, you know, you can have land that's directly, um, you know, with the reserve or First Nation, and then you can have land that was purchased by the First Nations. So they have different titles that go along with them. One could be federal and the other, they would own their title, like they would own that land and it would be titled to them. So allowing First Nations to, you know, utilize the reserve land, the federal land, the way they see fit, because that's often where they want to do their, you know, it's it's often where the, the extraction is, you know, in the land that they purchase, could potentially be for more homes or for more housing or for, you know, for, for to provide a place for people to live. So that's what we're kind of seeing in my community. Whereas, you know, others, they might want to purchase land within a city or on the outside, outskirts of a city and, you know, provide homes for their community members that are off reserve. So, you know, allowing us to do this and allowing us to, you know, work with cities, work with urban planners, that would be a huge step you know, regarding land and being able to house our people. And what's been the source of the government's resistance there? I think the resistance is that when you're on reserve federal land, you're more controlled. When you own your own land and it's titled and you're operating it the way you want, the way you see fit, you know, there's there's a, a balance that needs to happen. And I think the government, from my perspective, is holding on to that control. You know, they don't want to see autonomy. They don't want to see us doing things that are out of their scope because, you know, it's easier to control a group of people on a reserve than it is to control people off reserve. So, I mean, this is a very complicated issue because it's not, first of all, I, yeah, as a political science, you know, PhD, I'm still good for the word sovereignty. And so for me, it's more self-governance, self-determination. Um, in kind of the international system. I don't think, I don't know of any First Nations or Inuit or Métis settlements that want to have their own monetary, you know, their own currency or their own defense or their own passport system. So not sovereign in the same way that we would think about it, you know, kind of in an international context. But having more control over lands is also, is, is not always easy for First Nations. Some of these communities are two or three or 400 people and have limited capacity and limited resources. And, and are reluctant to take over more control, unless maybe you agree with me or don't, because as it is now, the federal government has a fiduciary duty. Uh, if there is, you know, if there was the garbage dump leaked into the nearby stream, it would be the federal government's liability. They would have to pay for it. Um, if there was some other, you know, kind of settlement or, or appeal, the federal government would have to pay for it. would have to pay for the legal costs. would have to pay for the mediation. So under the Land Management Act, for example, a First Nation can take over more control and then make their own laws and have their own land code. And many have chosen to do that. But some that are reluctant to do it are reluctant because they don't want to have to absorb the costs and the human resources and the, and the know-how and the management of those lands that right now the federal government does for them. So sometimes it is a simple capacity issue or there's mistrust in the community that, you know, the members won't vote for that in a referendum because they don't trust that their chief and council or their administration would do a good job, a better job um, doing it. So different, and Melissa alluded to this, different communities are at different stages of their, of their evolution to self-determination. And we need to respect that. And maybe a smaller community is not ready to take on, a community of two or 300, to take on all the responsibilities that a large municipality, even a province would have. Those are big, heavy things, you know, that only 200 people had to manage education, health, uh, you know, lands management, all these things, housing. Um, and then some other big ones. I, 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 for example, live on the Sutina Nation outside of Calgary. We have they have a subdivision, a residential subdivision. I pay my lease money to them every month, and they're a very wealthy, very well organized, sophisticated nation, and have been able to take over more of that authority and are comfortable with that and are sophisticated in doing that. So different communities are at different stages of this evolution. It takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of capacity to manage your own lands, and some aren't prepared. To, to release the federal government of their fiduciary duties and assume more sovereignty for themselves. If that flexibility already exists to some extent, what are the, the structural barriers in place that are preventing this uh, vision that Melissa's put forward from being realized then? But, but sorry, I guess structural, are, are there structural barriers in the laws themselves as they're written, I guess is the better way of putting the question. 
I mean, it, it definitely, and Melissa, <laughs> Melissa will be ready to jump on this too. Of course, the Indian Act has restrictions. As we talk about not being able to run at the speed of business, not being able to make decisions, not being able to get loans, not being able to use it as a, as a leverage to get um, capital. Um, have, having the minister has to have the final say on so many of these things if it's under the Indian Act and on reserve lands. So there is definitely barriers there. But even in the case where there have been land claims and large settlements like, you know, Nunavut and Nunutsiavut, um, you know, in the north, uh, where they aren't restricted by the Indian Act, there are still other structural barriers, capacity barriers, cultural barriers. Let's let me get your thoughts on that capacity aspect, Melissa. Is, is there a way to overcome that or, or overcome uh, that that mistrust idea, which is I, I don't think specific to indigenous communities. I certainly understand mistrust in, in politicians. But but how do you overcome that aspect of it? That's that's very difficult, um, especially in an indigenous community, because once you mistrust someone or a leader, that lingers for a very long time. You know, even if they've come back and apologize, it's still etched in our minds that this person did this. So it's very hard to come back and say, you know, let's fix this. Um, so oftentimes what happens, you know, if it happens with one of our leaders, we just don't vote them back in. Or if it happens, you know, with a provincial government or a federal government, we just say, you know, we're not dealing with that person anymore. So it's very hard to, once that mistrust is there, it's very hard to come back from that. Let me ask about the Indian Act, because this is something we, we hear people calling for its repeal. And I, I know that if you were to undertake uh, repealing the Indian Act, you would need to have a, a very solid and clear vision of, of what would replace it. Is that viable or desirable in, in your view, Melissa, to, to get rid of the Indian Act and, and start something new? I would definitely amend it. You know, like I, instead of trying to come up with something new, let's amend the parts that are broken. You know, there are a lot, there are pieces in there that need to be revised. There's a lot of amendment changes that have gone in that haven't even been addressed. So let's start there. You know, if they're not even looking at amendments as an option, well, maybe that's where we start. And that's, you know, politically how it looks in a province or even federally. You appeal or you try to amend a bill that's gone in, you know, and we need to address the Indian Act in the same manner. We don't need to do away with it, you know, because there are parts of it that are working. But what we need to do is bring it up to speed because it's no longer a paper from the 1800s that's working in today's society. So we do need to start looking at some of the changes that we can make in it. If you were a politician who were trying to do the best thing possible for the Indigenous communities of Canada that is politically viable, that is economically viable, where would be the starting point beyond sovereignty, Heather? Let me just, uh, first I'm going to answer the Indian Act because <laughs> lots of ministers have had ambitions or thought that they could come in and take away the Indian Act. And it was the old joke I know in Department of Indian Affairs that they, one minister, a conservative minister came in wanting to change the Indian Act and his nickname was Chief Running with Scissors because uh, anyone that wanted to change the Indian Act was, you know, in for, in for a wild ride and it never works. And like I mentioned before, there are legislations that have, um, that allow communities to opt out of parts of the Indian Act um, and a lot of these have been brought forth by communities themselves, you know, on oil and gas management or elections or land management, where they say, we hate these parts of the Indian Act, we need an, an option. And the federal government has played ball and created, you know, um, legislation that they can opt out. But going back to your other question, Andrew, where would you start? Um, and again, you have to respect that there's so many different communities and nations and context. And so I think allowing them to have as much self-determination as they want. And I think C-92, you know, we often criticize the liberal government, they do a lot of crazy things, but C-92 really was good legislation. That's on child welfare and allowing communities to take over. And they never gave up. They never, they never said, you can take our kids and you can do our, our family care. They never said that. And so this isn't giving it back, but, but getting out of the way of First Nations to reassert their jurisdiction over this. And again, it's on a community community basis, the community decides they create their own laws, they create their own structure, there's funding available and deciding when do they and how do they want to take back over child welfare. And I think almost every Canadian could agree that you we don't want China to be in charge of our kids, you know, child welfare. So why would a, a First Nation want Canada to be in charge of their child welfare? And we have a terrible record on it. So these kinds of uh, opportunities, 
We're providing a framework, providing support, providing time, and letting communities decide how and when they want to take back those parts of their own governance. When we talk about that uh, self-determination and sovereignty, I, I want to be clear on, on what it is that we're discussing here. Are we talking about communities that uh, levy their own taxes, are responsible for their own spending, that, that are basically mini countries with the exception of, you know, passport and, and defense and, and foreign affairs within Canada? Or are we talking about something that looks a little bit more like Quebec, where the federal government is, is giving them money, but they have a lot of autonomy and a lot of uh, their own determination in, in how they spend that money? And, and how they allocate it. I think it should look a lot like Quebec. You know, they're part of Canada, they're part of this country, but yet they are given the autonomy to make decisions, um, you know, particularly for their province. And I think that's how it should work within First Nations communities. Like we, we don't want to be separate and apart from Canada. Uh, you know, we want to work with Canada, we want to be part of this economy. So kind of segregating us how we are is not working. What we need to do is we need to, with self-determination, you know, work with Canada and be part of this country. Yeah, I mean, I think First Nations, they can and they should charge taxes. And maybe they don't charge it to their own people because it's, you know, a big issue, but they often charge fees. Uh, they often charge levies. So that potential exists. I pay, you know, I would pay to the Sutina Nation, for example. Um, so there is that option, but but it's this it's the scale. There is no economy of scale. Even even Nunavut, which is a public government, but is the closest thing to a large indigenous government, 40,000 people still is going to be always reliant on the federal government. That's still too few people to run all the services in the way that people in Canada expect modern services. So for me, the more that Indigenous groups can operate in tribal councils or regional councils or treaty areas to pool that those services and have that economy of scale, the better. Uh, but, 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 you know, it's their land. We're all we're all benefiting from it. So I don't think there's, you know, anything wrong or unjust and, you know, of of having some transfers from the federal government and some and some support on the governance side where they want it and how they want it. Melissa Embarkey, policy analyst and outreach coordinator for the McDonald Laurier Institute, also a veteran of the oil and gas sector in Canada, and Dr. Heather Exner Perot, fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, and uh, many, many titles connected to any number of, of resource and, and northern projects, including the Saskatchewan Indigenous Economic Development Network and the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. Uh, Heather, Melissa, thank you both so much. This was a, a very uh, informative discussion. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You know, it, it's such a complex issue, and I was really trying. I didn't expect that we'd have solved all the problems of Canada after just 40 minutes, but I, I realized that getting even just a, a few concrete, politically viable solutions that a politician could champion would be very difficult. And I, I think the big takeaway from there is that we're not just talking about one Indigenous community or, or even uh, a community that has one particular voice. You've got certainly national groups like like the uh, Assembly of First Nations, but but even then, they may not speak for the interests and needs of all of these different communities that are impacted. I, I think, like anything, the best advice is to let the government get out of the way. And this is not something that I would say is unique to Indigenous Canadians in entirely. I would like to see the federal government get out of the way of provinces. I'd like to see provinces get out of the way of the municipalities. We're not talking about mass separation or secession or even segregation, but a, but a recognition that different people want different things. Different groups of Canadians in different regional parts of the country want different things. So uh, no simple answers, but again, we don't do these segments for simple answers. We do them to really delve into the scope of some of the challenges and hopefully have a bit more of an honest discussion about them than we see in federal politics. So with that, my thanks again to Heather and Melissa and to all of you for tuning in. We'll be back Tuesday with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. This is is the Andrew Lawton Show. Thank you, God bless, and good day. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.